because you certainly have not forgotten us. May we never forget you. Amen. Well, I want to take a few minutes today before we dismiss for this wonderful fellowship meal slash picnic slash I hope our neighbors around us come and join us with this for this. The thing, just for a few minutes, we may even take this up again next week. The true cost of freedom. I want you to look with me at Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3, 13. And stand with me if you would. I just want to read this verse briefly. We look at other verses as well. Galatians 3, 13. Paul's talking to these Galatians about how we don't go beyond Jesus Christ. We don't need more than the gospel. We don't want to add anything to it. And he says this, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree. He redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Fulfilling the Old Testament, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. We've read together what? This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And my, my prayer today is that we will, as, again, as dual citizens, that we'll appreciate the cost that's been spent so that we can, as Joshua prayed earlier, we can gather here unmolested, but also recognize that there's a, there's a cost of freedom for e our eternity that we dare not ever forget or take for granted. Thank you. Please be seated. You've heard the line. You've probably used the line. I, I know I have. Freedom isn't free. We, we hear that. We say that. And really... You can go back to the history of mankind and see that that is the case. It doesn't matter where you drop in in history. You can go back to God's people who fled to Egypt in the face of a famine, and, and God providentially provided for them there in, uh, in Egypt, raising up Joseph, one of their own, to care for them. The scripture says there was a Pharaoh who grew up, rose up, who didn't know Joseph, didn't know who Joseph was, didn't care. All he knew is that these Jews were pest, pesty people and they, they just were multiplying too much. And so they were put into bondage. They were subjected to bondage. And God redeemed them. He rescued them. He delivered them. And it cost the life of many, many lambs spread over the doorpost, their blood. And it cost the life of the firstborn of every one in Egypt, every one of the Egyptians, to redeem them, to purchase their freedom. This Tuesday, Lord willing, we will celebrate 241 years as a, as a nation. The Lord tarries, most of you will be alive to celebrate the 250th anniversary as a nation. Our forefathers came over here to escape religious persecution, began to set up uh, their lives, their livelihood, uh, their worship all along the eastern seaboard. The colonies had different approaches to worship, different emphases. They had one thing in common, though. They did not intend for the tyranny of England to follow them, and yet it did. And so July 4th, 1776, we declared independence from England. And I want you to get a, I want you to get a visual today of the cost of freedom. Then, and as it continues, because you see, freedom not, not only is never free, freedom must be uh, diligently and vigilantly maintained. Otherwise, you lose freedom. Let's look at these graphics here. The American Revolution, 4,435 sons, 
brothers, fathers, gave their lives so that you and I could celebrate freedom in this nation and enjoy our freedom in Christ today, unmolested. The War of 1812, 2,260 of our fellow countrymen gave their lives. The Indian Wars, which spread out from 1817 to 1898, 1,000 Americans died. The Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848, 1,733 battle casualties. The Civil War, one of the most awful, awful chapters in our nation's history. 140,413 Union soldiers, 74,524 Confederate soldiers, fighting each one they believed for that which was the best. The final result being that the Union was kept together intact. Spanish-American War, 1898, 385 battle casualties. World War I, 1917 to 1918, 53,402 casualties. World War II, from 1941 to 1945, 291,557 casualties. There's a reason that that generation is called the Great Generation. The Korean War, 1950 to 1953, 33,739 casualties. The Vietnam War, the most misunderstood and arguably the war where our veterans were the most mistreated when they came back home, 47,434 casualties. The Persian Gulf War, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, 148 casualties. The global war on terrorism, which has been going on since 2001, 6,915 casualties. If you're wondering about the total war dead, what, what has it cost in blood and treasure? 657,946 people. Freedom isn't free. You enjoy some things today because some people laid down their lives. We were, we were, uh, we experienced something Friday that I've never seen before. We went to Clifton's uh, graduation from basic training. Certainly proud of him, but I was gripped. I'd already done this studying, reflecting with this, and I was simply gripped as these young men stood up and recited their oath of allegiance to uphold and defend the Constitution from enemies foreign and domestic. The verve which, which, with which they did that I thought they're doing that so that we can do what we do here, so that you can do whatever it is you're going to do Tuesday. Freedom is not free. But you know, there's a cost for spiritual freedom. The privilege of being called a follower of Jesus Christ, of confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, came at great cost to the Son of God. The Bible describes it as uh, redemption. I appreciated Joshua giving us a cluster of, of songs today about redemption and being the redeemed. That picture we had in Revelation 5, Jesus said, I won't partake of this meal again until I'm gathered with all of you, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And you see what that's going to be like and look like, that rallying around the throne. People from every tribe and nation and language and people all over the globe singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain for he has, he has ransomed or purchased or redeemed people for God. What a glorious, glorious time, celebration that's going to be. And that was purchased for us at great cost. I want us to see today, maybe, maybe just begin today to think about this because we're going to celebrate Independence Day on the 4th and maybe it'll be good for us to come back and just reflect back upon it. But I want you to see something here. This idea of redemption. It means in the Greek, there's several different words used, but it has this common theme, to purchase. It was a picture used in the slave market of the day. If you wanted to buy a slave, for yourself. You, you purchase them. You could actually purchase them to set them free, and that's the picture here, to buy out of the slave market with a view to setting free. 
You remember the prophet Hosea married Gomer. We don't know the timetable and the sequence, but somewhere along the way, Gomer became a very immoral woman. Even had a child by another man. They named the child Loemi, not my child. She was wasted, ruined, seemingly lost to her husband, the prophet. And God came to Hosea and said, go get Gomer. She's in the slave market. Go buy her. And Hosea, obeying God, took a sum of money, went to that marketplace, and he purchased Gomer. And God said, that's what I've done to you. The reference, of course, was back to Egypt when he bought Egypt with blood. He tells Gomer to do that as a model for what he will do in his own son. You see, friends, brothers and sisters, if you belong to Jesus Christ today, it's because he purchased you. We're going to look in 1 Corinthians as we're studying through that on Sunday mornings. Paul's going to challenge us. Don't you realize you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. He's talking about redemption. Redeemed out of the slave market of sin. That's what happens to a son of Adam or daughter of Eve when you come to know Jesus Christ. You're, you're bought out of the slave market of sin. And so I want you to, just to think with me for a few minutes this morning about redemption as we look at it from, in three phases. Uh, there, is, there is redemption in our past, what the Scripture calls justification. There is redemption in our present, otherwise known as sanctification. And then redemption in our future, otherwise known as glorification. And the Scripture uses the word redeem, some form of it to speak to all of these. Let me re just remind you real quick that we've gone through this. I've been here almost 13 years. We've, we've done this over and over. And some of you could stand up if I stumble and finish the sentences for me, and that's glorious. And some of you are going to say, gosh, I don't think I've ever heard that before. And that's okay, because if you recognize you've never heard it before, then it means you've heard it now, okay? This idea of justification is a once-for-all event. It is where we are we, we could say we have been saved from the penalty of sin. You and me, everyone you know, the nicest person you know, was born into this world, the scripture says, dead in trespasses and sins. In other words, given over to sin. Not being as bad as they can be. Just being who they want to be and not who God wants them. Justification teaches us that in the death of Jesus Christ, as we receive that by faith, we can say, I have been delivered from the penalty of sin. It's a once for all event, justification is. The picture we have in the scripture when you read about it is the courtroom. We come before the judge because, friends, one day every one of us will stand before the Lord to give account for our sin. And there's only two ways to stand. One is to stand guilty, condemned, and sentenced to eternity apart from God, and justly so, or to stand guilty as charged and yet find yourself forgiven because Jesus paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. Justification is that. It's, it's God, we talked to our children this morning, God regarding sinners as if they'd never sinned. How can he do that? He does that because of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And our simply saying with childlike faith, Lord, I believe. I believe in Jesus. I want Jesus to be my Lord and my Savior. I want to be forgiven by you. I repent of my sin. Justification. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification, though, you, uh, the old writers would say, you never find justification without sanctification. The person that tells you, well, I've been justified, but they're not growing in grace and sanctification, it does not know what justification is. In fact, they would speak of them as twin, as twins. 
that wherever you find real sanctification, you know justification is not far behind. Wherever you find real justification, you know sanctification is near. If justification says, I have been saved from the penalty of sin, sanctification says, I am being saved from the power of sin. It doesn't matter whether you've been saved 10 minutes or 60 years. You're different than you were before you were saved. There's a change that's come. I said, sons of Adam and daughters of Eve come into this world, not necessarily being as bad as they can be, but just being what they want to be. When you're saved, you ask, you notice that Saul of Tarsus, a very religious person, when he was saved on the Damascus Road, remember what he said? Lord, what would you have me to do? When you're saved, doesn't mean you don't, that you stop wanting, but it does mean that the battle begins where your wants are being submitted to God's wants, and the Spirit is subduing those and making your wants more like what God wants. And it's an ongoing thing. Yes, justification, once for all, declared not guilty, forgiven, saved from the penalty of sin, the penalty of sin, the wages of sin or death. Sanctification is I am, I am being saved. I'm being cleansed. I hope you can look back in your life and say, well, there was, there was a time when, uh, I've told you this before, and I say this to my shame, all right? I say this to my shame, but it's, it's just true. I was a very religious person in church. <laughs> very religious person in church. Very religious person when I got around church people outside of church. But if you'd have caught me on the tennis court when I was having a bad uh, match, you wouldn't have thought of me as a religious person. I had a, I had a tongue with a temper that was uh, pretty ugly, pretty ugly. When the Lord really saved me at 20, not to pretend saved that I went through at 10, but when he really saved me at 20, as a kindness to me, one of the first things he did was he, he changed my tongue. I look back and I think he did that to assure me that this was real this time. I began to take control of my speech. There are other areas too as I've been blessed to walk with the Lord for, for 44 years now. But you can think of some surely in your own life. You see, one of the most perplexing conversations I ever had with a friend of mine, a fellow named Bernie, kept, he kept insisting that he was saved. I said, well, tell me about the change, Bernie. Well, I've never changed. I've always been the same person. I said, no. Conversion is change. You, I said, Bernie, you were born walking this way. And if you were saved and the Lord turned you, you were converted, you began to walk with him. No, never happened. But I'm saved. You can think of things. You see, redemption, as it relates to our present, is I am being saved. It's sanctification. I am being saved from the power of sin. But there's one more. I want to share this with you. Then, Lord willing, we're going to pick this up next week and dive into the Scripture references on this. There's one more. Redemption as it relates to our future. As glor glorious. Justification is glorious. I've been delivered from the penalty of sin. No longer charged. Can't charge me again. Devil charged me and says, you know what, Askel, you're a dirty, rotten sinner. So, you know, thanks for reminding me about that because you've just reminded me just how much Jesus shed his blood to purchase my redemption. The devil points out my struggles as I, as I grow in grace and I stumble and fall backward. He says, you're so inconsistent, you're such a hypocrite. I say, thank you for reminding me just how Jesus purchased my salvation. But redemption in the future tense means that I shall be saved 
from the very presence of sin. I have been saved from the power. I am being, uh, from the penalty. I am being saved from the power. I shall be saved from the very presence. Think about this, brothers and sisters. No more sinful options. No more sinful inclinations. All made new. Gathered with the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. Worshiping the Lamb. All that's coming out of my tongue, my thoughts, my actions is, is only pure obedience, pure righteousness. Your redemption, your final redemption. You see, the cost of freedom for us began in that perfect life that Jesus lived. He pledged in eternity past, I'll come. As it's written in the book of the law, I will come to do your will, O God. But he came and lived perfectly. Then he died in our place. He, he suffered the punishment due unto your sin and my sin. He satisfied God's divine justice by, by living a perfect life and then suffering and dying in our place and rising from the grave. We're going to see these things in the scriptures that speak to this past, present, and future reality of our salvation. I hope you have great plans for Independence Day. Celebrate with family, fireworks, whatever. Brothers and sisters, don't forget that that one day celebration, because we're a free nation, and as Christians, we ought to have an everyday celebration because of what we have been redeemed from, what we've been delivered from and delivered for, we're going to see next. Delivered for. From sin and for holiness. Freedom is not free in terms of it not costing anything. And you and I live in a generation that doesn't appreciate freedom in Christ or freedom as a nation. And the scripture warns us about that. But in your freedom, don't use it for self-indulgence. So I'm going to ask you this today, God willing, I'll ask you this next week. How do you intend to use your freedom? If you're simply an American and haven't been saved, I pray that you'll use that freedom opportunity to seek the Lord, get yourself under the gospel, and come to know Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, who happens to be an American by God's providence, then I pray that you're using your freedom to cultivate grace, growing in grace, sharing the gospel with others. There are people all around the world today who, have, who know nothing of the freedom we enjoy, who are laying down their lives to share the gospel with people, some whom, when they hear it, will kill them. How will you use your freedom? I just want to know that. I pray we'll redeem the time and be found faithful. Hear well done, good and faithful stewards. Because we've been given a stewardship of freedom that's not known in very many places on the earth. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the cross. Oh, God. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for redemption. Help us, help we, the redeemed, to sing praise to our King, to lift up the name of Jesus, to live as free men and women, not falling again into the yoke of bondage that we've been delivered from. Help us to live in the full vigor of being delivered from the penalty of sin and marching on to Zion, being delivered from the power of sin, looking forward to the day when sin will be eradicated around us and in us and will be gathered with the Lamb 